Good afternoon. I uh, also would uh, certainly like to uh, thank Drs. Flanagan, Downs, and uh, Dr. Mungo for the opportunity to present the take-home messages for penile and urethral cancer. Unlike many of my colleagues, I had relatively few presentations to go over. There are actually only nine presentations on penile and urethral cancer during the meeting. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to group the uh, uh, presentations that were uh, somewhat similar together uh, into uh, distinct topics. I will give you a summary of each of these, and then I will give you the high-level take-home points for each of these topics. So in terms of urethral cancer, there are only two presentations on urethral cancer, and these dealt by and large with the uh, question of whether lymph node dissection should be performed in patients with clinically node-negative uh, disease with urethral cancer. So the group from the United Kingdom uh, asked the question is whether squamous cell carcinoma of the anterior male urethra can be managed following a penile cancer best practice pathway. So they examined their experience with 77 patients with squamous cell carcinoma of the urethra versus 882 patients with squamous cell carcinoma of the penis, and they treated all patients per their uh, penile cancer best practice pathway, which included penile sparing surgery where appropriate, and sentinel lymph node dissection for clinical N0 disease. Despite the fact that the patients with the uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the urethra presented with higher grade, higher stage, uh, worse subtype features, their actual three-year disease-specific survival was comparable to the patients with squamous cell carcinoma of the penis. In fact, in patients at highest risk with extracapsular uh, nodal disease, the three-year disease-specific survival was actually better in the squamous cell uh, carcinoma of the urethra patients compared to those with penile cancer. Uh, in addition, the sentinel load uh, biopsy yield was similar uh, across both sets of patients, suggesting that perhaps this is uh, a good way to manage these patients, particularly in the absence of any additional uh, data to direct us. Second group out of Chicago looked at the National Cancer Database and identified 725 men with at least T1 disease. Of these men, 26% underwent a lymph node dissection. Among the patients with clinical N0 disease, 21% of these patients wonder, underwent lymph node dissection with only 9% showing lymph node positive disease. Among men with higher uh, stage disease, clinical uh, N1 to N2 disease, now about 76% of the patients uh, underwent lymph node dissection with 84% of the patients having positive uh, lymph nodes. Positive lymph nodes was uh, indeed associated with worse overall survival, but interestingly, the lymph node dissection itself was associated with improved overall survival only for the patients with clinical N1 to N2 disease as seen on the figure on the right. The lymph node dissection was not associated with improved overall survival for the N0 patients. So the take-home messages from this meeting from the urethral cancer section was that lymph node dissection is important clearly for patients with clinical N1 and N2 disease, but the value of the lymph node dissection for clinical N0 disease was a little bit less clear, but may depend on patient population, certainly depends on the primary characteristics, or the, I should say the characteristics of the primary tumor and the type of lymph node dissection performed as uh, the, the, the studies demonstrating the sentinel lymph node biopsy did seem to show higher yield of, um, of positive uh, nodes in that setting, at least when performed again by, by uh, people with expertise doing this. Shifting to penile cancer, there were uh, several abstracts identifying uh, the, uh, trying to identify positive nodes in men with, again, clinically N0 uh, disease. Um, we just saw uh, briefly one of our previous presenters demonstrated or presented this study, which identified 95 patients undergoing PET FC, uh, PET uh, excuse me, FDG PET-CT for the staging of pelvic lymph nodes in patients with known inguinal metastasis. Um, the PET-CT outcomes were compared to uh, pelvic lymph node dissections, other positive imaging or follow-up at one year. And I'm presenting the per-pelvic side analysis, whereas the previous presenter presented the per-patient analysis, but with similar findings with uh, reasonable sensitivity, but a very impressive negative predictive value of 92%, suggesting that this technology might, in fact, be helpful um, helping to further risk stratify patients and maybe ultimately identifying patients that otherwise might not need a pelvic node dissection uh, despite their relatively high-risk disease. Uh, the group out of the UK, uh, same group, again, also looked at the impact of micrometastatic pelvic lymph node involvement on three-year survival. So they identified a subset of 31 men with inguinal node extracapsular spread and negative pelvic nodes by CT. Uh, the majority of these patients underwent robotic pelvic lymphadenectomy, and importantly, 84% received adjuvant chemoradiation. 
in this high-risk population, 52% of the uh, uh, men did show micrometastatic disease. But interestingly, there was no difference in the three-year overall survival between the negative and positive node dissection patients. The authors conclude that the implication of the similar survival curves is unclear. Poster 3714 by the same, uh, same group looked at the surgical management of the clinically negative contralateral groin when the ipsilateral groin is clinically and pathologically positive. So this was a study of 42 patients with unilateral both clinically node positive and pathologically proven node positive disease with a contralateral side uh, that was uh, negative for any clinical signs of disease. These men underwent a sentinel lymph node biopsy and in this population 38% had positive nodes on the contralateral groin. And this was uh, compared to a group of patients with bilateral clinical N0 disease who underwent bilateral sentinel node biopsy where only 14% of the uh, patients were found have at least one uh, lymph node positive. So the take-home messages for the lymph node dissection was that the FDG PET may be helpful in identification of men with positive pelvic lymph nodes. Men with high-risk inguinal node features do have a high rate of pelvic micrometastatic disease, though its effect on overall survival is unclear at this point, for, at least from this study. And men with positive inguinal nodes do have a significant rate of contralateral nodal disease that can be identified uh, by sentinel lymph node biopsy, again, by uh, expert practitioners. There were two studies that looked at molecular markers of penile cancer. So the first study uh, was a group out of Florida that looked at the uh, PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway. They had a tissue microarray, of tissue microarray of 57 tumors that were stained for P10, AKT, and S6. And they found that AKT and S6 overexpression was associated with improved overall and recurrent uh, free survival as indicated by the four plots on the uh, right side of the screen. A second uh, international group looked at the expression of PDL1 uh, in squamous cell carcinoma and also in the tumor infiltrating immune cells that were present in the specimens. Uh, interestingly, they found that the staining overall, however, was at a fairly low level. On average, less than 5% of the cells were positive in, this, in the specimens that were positive. The PDL1 staining was more common in the infiltrating immune cells than in the tumor cells. On, by one of the antibodies, it was 45% versus 7%, and the PDL1 staining in both the tumor and the tumor infiltrating immune cells was associated with higher grade and stage disease. So the take-home message here is that both of these pathways uh, show prognostic significance in penile cancer, and uh, certainly the checkpoint inhibitor pathway has uh, uh, the potential to be a therapeutic target, as it's been shown to be in uh, many other cancers. Moving on to uh, the surgical approaches uh, in penile cancer, the uh, MD Anderson group published their experience with their robotic-assisted inguinal lymphadenectomy. So they reported on 18 patients which were beyond their initial uh, uh, experience um, that uh, underwent the RAIL procedure. And these were compared to a historical group of 17 patients who underwent an open superficial inguinal lymph node dissection. While the uh, node yield was the same, the operative time was longer in the uh, RAIL uh, patients, and while the overall rate of complications was similar between the two groups, there was a higher level uh, or a higher uh, fraction of clavian grade three or higher complications in the robotic group. Um, a uh, multi-institutional group here in the U.S. Uh, reported on 17 patients that they were able to identify from 1976 until 2013 who underwent salvage surgery for radiation failure for penile cancer. And unfortunately, these patients all had a pretty poor uh, uh, outcome. Uh, the one-year um, overall survival was only 68 percent, and only about a third of the patients were alive still at three years. Earlier today, uh, there was an excellent uh, plenary session on the tips and tricks of penile and urethral cancer surgery, moderated by Dr. Wessels. Uh, the, the panel members, Dr. Shux, uh, Drs. Shuxman, uh, Alberson, and Ralph, uh, discussed um, uh, various aspects of penile surgery from glandectomy, <coughs> glands resurfacing, all the way to complete penectomy and uh, reconstruction, including for, uh, phalloplasty. Now, I am not going to be able to do any justice to this presentation, but I do highly recommend that you uh, seek it out on the videos if you missed it, because it was uh, quite an excellent presentation. Some of the things that were emphasized, however, included the use of organ sparing surgery when it's possible. Uh, for big and bulky tumors, it is important, of course, as we all know, to use wide local excision for oncologic reasons. And then uh, Dr. Ralph implored for individuals to use forethought during the resection phase to try to uh, make the reconstructive process easier, specifically trying to maintain maximum urethral length 
um, in cases, again, to help make the reconstruction uh, easier. So the take-home messages for this last section include the fact that robotic inguinal lymph node dissection is feasible with a similar overall rate of complications as the open, though the grade of complications may be higher. Uh, it's the rare patient that uh, undergoes uh, salvage surgery for uh, radiation therapy, at least at these centers, and unfortunately all uniformly have a poor prognosis even with the salvage surgery. And complex reconstructive cases may require multidisciplinary input and may in fact benefit from centralization to centers of excellence. Thank you. I'd like to first thank President Flanagan and Dr. Tracy Downs for, and the planning committee for giving me the opportunity to present, and all of you for staying, for giving the out, listen to our take home messages, discussing outcomes. I have no real conflicts of interest. Um, however, I would like to list these just in case someone thinks they are a conflict. Great. The first project is a bladder cancer project. The title is looking at ge geomapping and spatial analysis of environmental exposure in bladder cancer in Erie County and Niagara Counties in New York. This was presented by a group from Roswell Park Cancer Institute and also was the best abstract of, of that section. They identified, to, identified and described geographic clusters of bladder cancer in Erie and Niagara County in New York among 976 bladder cancer patients of all stages treated at Roswell Park between February 2008 and, two, and 2018. They identified any spatial relationship between environmental hazards and bladder prevalence using a geographic information system software um, to map um, patients' residential addresses. They used statistic, statistic analysis to identify hotspots and spatial clusters of patients at the census block level, accounting for population density of people greater than 50 years old. These are two sample t-tests using um, calculated differences in the mean bladder cancer prevalence of sensing tracts containing hazardous waste sites or impaired water versus those without such risk. Three statistically significant clusters of bladder cancer patients existed in Erie County and Niagara counties of New York. Pollutants known to be associated with bladder cancers were present in all three clusters. The highlighted red areas are these clustered areas and usually, as you can see, there are multiple areas of pollutants associated with these clusters. Of note, I actually live in Erie County, and no, I do not live in those areas. <laughs> Significance, although there are several limitations, including but not limited to, not accounting for, for residential history, such as the time of exposure, how long they lived in those neighborhoods, or other confounding factors. It is a single institutional study as well. But having said that, this line of research is important because there are known unexplained geographic, gender, racial, and socioeconomic differences in bladder cancer outcomes, and this has the potential to explain some of those variations. On the, a similar project was done by research at the University of Illinois in Chicago looking at prostate cancer. And what they did, the title of this was Association Between Environmental Quality and Prostate Cancer Stage of Diagnosis. They assessed the relationship between environmental quality and prostate cancer stage of diagnosis. The study population they used SEER um, from patients diagnosed between 2010 and 2014, and they used the environmental quality index at the county level and overall and in, in the separate domains. The study cohort was over 200,000 prostate cancer patients, 92% were localized cancers. Statistically significant, they know significantly significant higher environmental index quality index in metastatic versus localized cancers. The significant overall in five subdomains. Data suggests that worse environment is associated with prostate cancer aggressiveness. This line of research is important. Because there are known racial and socioeconomic disparities in prostate cancer incidence, disease, and aggressiveness in survivor outcomes, history of environment exposure has the potential to explain some of this variation. This makes sense because we know that the history of exposure to Agent Orange has significant negative impact on prostate cancer incidence, disease aggressiveness, and survivor outcomes. Also, if note, poor and black people are at higher risk of living and working in areas that have a worse environmental index. Therefore, this may explain some of the variations and outcomes reported in these populations. Next study. They looked at, I thought this study was extremely interesting. Should Gleason score at the positive surgical margin appear on the pathology report um, for robotic-assisted radical prostatectomy? This is from a group out of Japan. 
Basically, they set out to evaluate the impact of Gleason score at surgical Martian compared with highest Gleason score in the specimen on the risk of biochemical recurrence after prostatectomy robotically. Gleason score at surgical margins were reviewed and pathologic values for prediction of biochemical recurrence was compared to the highest Gleason score. Notice that in most, in 22% of the specimens, this was discordant. And basically, in the multivariate cost proportional hazard model, the concordance index, or the model of using Gleason score at surgical margin, was significantly higher than that of using the highest Gleason score. In addition, the highest Gleason score of the specimen, this noted that the highest Gleason score of the specimen should be appear in the pathology report. Although the sample size is small, 107 patients, I think this concept is worth exploring in a larger cohort and may provide insights into the variation in the outcomes of patients with positive surgical margins in the literature. Stay tuned and let's see where this line of research takes us. Variations in, in physician-specific episode payment for urologic cancer surgery, implications of the merit-based incentives program, this side of the group at the University of Michigan. They examined 90-day physician-specific overall and component surgical episode payment for prostatectomy, nephrectomy, and cystectomy using serum Medicare data, patients diagnosed between 2008 and 2012, over 14,000 patients, over 1,800 physicians, evaluate surgery 90-day episode payment, payment differential in the last and most expensive surgeons, look at the main drivers, index hospitalizations, professional services, post-acute care and readmissions. Basically, when you looked at it, it varied, varied by whatever cancer they were treated. For, for prostate cancer, it was noted which, which treatment was received, physician services. For kidney cancer, it was post-acute care. For bladder cancer, it was a hospital index. And this is all similar across cancer stage, number of comorbid diseases and regions. And what they concluded that given the limitations of physician-specific physician uh, measurements, that CMS should direct efforts to the components rather than the individual physicians. And that's highly unlikely that they'll do that. However, early and consistent improvement of quality of life and urinary symptoms, looking at um, oxybotulizing toxin A in overactive bladder cancer, overactive, look at me, overactive bladder patients with urinary incontinence in a randomized placebo controlled trial. This was a randomized multi-center placebo controlled phase four post-marketing trial evaluating quality of life outcomes and, outcomes and treatment response as early as within the first week of enter to two treatment of overactive bladder patient and urinary incontinence. Basically what you saw that, that the Dachelines and Tyson had improvement in changes of baseline of urinary incontinence, proportion of patients with 1% reduction, 100% reduction of urinary incontinence episodes per day, and the proportion of patients using non-incontinence pads, and it also showed improvement of social embarrassment domains and social limitation domains. They concluded that treatment benefits with oxybotulinotoxin A100 units was seen in early within the first week of patient with overactive bladder. Early improvement of urinary symptoms and continence episodes were sustained for at least 12 weeks. And it's consistent with improvement were also observed across a number of disease-specific quality of life measures. This last study, examined was Brown by Brown University, examined the trends in underrepresented minorities in urology. Basically, the background here is diversity in healthcare workforce, including recruitment and retention of underrepresented minorities, is, a, is critical to patient care in addressing healthcare disparities. The study aim was to examine and compare five year trends of underrepresented minority representation in urology residency programs and look at the data from the ACGME. Underrepresented minorities, underrepresented minorities were defined as Asian, Pacific Islanders, Hispanics, Blacks, and Native American and Alaskans and others. The proportion of American minorities was compared to under, underrepresented minorities in other surgical fields and in the medical field overall. As you can see, urology basically was lacking compared to other surgeons by about 3% overall and other, other fields by about 11%. These findings demonstrate that a proportion of underrepresented minority trained neurology is basically lagging behind. The significance of this presentation is that, that there are well known racial disparities in healthcare in the United States. The causes of these disparities are multifocal. Some provider modifiable factors include, but are limited to, the lack of physician trust, implicit bias, 
racial disparities in treatment recommendation, and racial disparities in treatment. One possible solution to address these modifiable factors is a racially ethnic, ethnically diverse physician workforce that reflects the population. If this is true, urology is significantly lagging behind other surgical specialties in medicine overall. We must make a decision as to whether or not this is acceptable. And if not, we must create and implement a strategic plan to correct it. Thank you very much.